This next chapter starts to get into some of the rules of derivatives, but now applied to three-dimensional space. So we did a lot of work in the last unit with vectors and rules for vectors and vector-valued functions. Now we start taking a look at a bigger picture set of calculus rules that applies to functions in three dimensions in terms of limits and continuity and derivatives and all that. So I'm going to let you look through some of the information that's in the PowerPoint. We eventually get to the point we want to talk about domain of a function. Now you realize that these functions in three variables, instead of being written as things like f of x equals, they're now written as f of x, y. And sometimes you'll see them written as z equals f of x, y. I put my little marks through the z because otherwise my z's look like twos. I'm not sure if that mark actually helps, but at least lets you know that no, nah, that's not a 2, that's a z. So suppose I want to find the domain of a function. And I'm not just looking at what x values I can put in. I'm looking at what x and y values will work in the function. So in this one over here, what values can I put in for x and y? Well, I can put in anything as long as x and y are not the same thing. If x and y are the same thing, then I end up with a 0 over, or zero, over 0 situation. So because I don't want that, then I just say that anything will work except for when x and y are the same value. So my domain is anywhere where x is not equal to y. All right, for the second one, what do I need? I need what's under the radical to not be 0, and I need it to be positive. Well, now I'm not going to get just a single value. I want this thing to be something that's bigger than 16. Because right? if I have that, then 16 minus 16 is 0. Anything bigger than 0 means that the function is defined and was under the radical is not negative. So what I'm looking for is anywhere where x squared plus y squared is greater than 16. It's the points outside of a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 4. Okay, so that's what the physical interpretation of that is. For this thing down the bottom, the sine of x squared minus y squared, well, I don't know. I can take sines of 0, right? The sine of 0 is 0. I can take signs of negative numbers. That just means I'm going backwards along the unit circle. Certainly, I can take signs of positive numbers. So this will be any possible value of x and y will work as the domain of that function. All right, so sometimes you really do get an all real numbers thing, except this time it's both the x's and the y's have to match. This is just to remind you that in two dimensions, we talk about x, f of x as our x and y. Here, we sometimes talk about x, y, z. But the z, instead of represented as z, is represented telling you that that z is a function of the x term and the y term in that three-dimensional point. Also, vertical line test. You had vertical line tests. Remember, if you wanted to find out if something was a function, a circle was not a function because you could pass a vertical line through, and it would intersect in more than one point. Well, there is a vertical line test in three dimensions also. It's just that the vertical line test is now parallel to the z-axis and not parallel to the y-axis. So if you have one of those ellipsoids, those eggs, that are solid top and bottom, try drawing that vertical line through, it fails. But if you have one of those elliptic paraboloids that doesn't have a lid on it, then you're okay. You'll pass it through. The only time that it will hit is over there. So as long as it doesn't intersect more than once, then it passes the vertical line test. All right, let's take a look at graphs. Suppose you wanted to graph a couple of these functions. What kinds of things would be important if you wanted to graph 2x squared plus 3y squared. Well, the first thing is you need to know the domain. The domain for this thing is all real numbers, all real numbers for both x and y. How about the range? Well, the range is going to be z values that are greater than or equal to 0. So then you can start looking at that um, table that you had from section 13.6, and this thing turns out to be one of those elliptic paraboloids. There's your z-axis, your y-axis can go this way, your x-axis can go that way. And so it's going to be one of these guys that sits like a bowl here. And it's entirely above the z-axis. So I'm not plotting individual points, just a general shape of what it looks like. That's a general shape of what it looks like. It does not dip below the x-y plane because all the z values are greater than 0. On the other hand, take a look at this guy down here. f of x-y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. If I want to figure out what the domain is, then, first of all, what's under this radical has to be at least 0. So 1 minus x squared minus y squared has to be greater than, or it could be equal to 0. Move things around, and I get negative x squared minus y squared is greater than or equal to negative 1. Divide through by negative 1. Remember, when you divide through by negative, it changes the sign. 
And so I get that. What does that mean? That means that all the x squared plus y squared values have to be less than or equal to 1. Whenever I start subtracting from 1, it gets smaller. So as the x and y values increase, then I end up with something that's getting smaller and smaller. So it starts at z equals 1. That's the max. Any value that I put in here for x and for y that's bigger than 0, then that thing is going to come down. So it turns out it's actually a hemisphere. Sits on the xy plane. and z equals 1 is its maximum value. Okay, When it intersects the xy plane, it comes out to be a circle. It's the circle x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. All right, we had talked a little bit in the PowerPoint about level curves. Level curves are the places in the xy plane where the um, function f of xy is equal to 0. So suppose I want to take a look at level curves for something like z equals x squared minus y squared. Well, what do the level curves look like? If I say I want z sub 0 equals x minus y squared, and I go to solve for that z sub 0, I end up with what? I end up with z sub 0 plus y squared equals x. If it makes it more interesting to find different values for z sub 0, let z sub 0 be 1. And I'll get 1 plus y squared is equal to x. Let z sub 0 be 0. And I get y squared equals x. If I try something like z sub 0 equals negative 1, then I'm going to get negative 1 plus y squared equals x. And when you go to graph it, it's going to turn out that it falls outside of this window. Right? These are x values, so I want the x's to go from 0 to 4, and I want the y's to go from negative 2 to 2. If the x's go from 0 to 4, this thing is going to push itself to the left of that axis. What are these things? They're just a bunch of sideways parabolas. Right? Z equals 0 would look like this, x equals y squared. Right? So that's for z equals 0. If I want what happens when z equals 1, I get y squared plus 1, so that moves it one more in the x direction. So here is for z sub 0 equals 1. And now you can see that if I had kept that third one there, I would have ended up with something that intersected out here, which is outside my window. All right, let's take a look at this third guy down here. This z equals e to the negative x squared minus 2y squared. What do the level curves look like for this thing? I think I'm going to come over to the side and do a little writing over here. So replace that z with a z sub 0. Let's see where we're going. I get z sub 0 equals e to the negative x squared minus 2y squared. It would help if I took natural logs of both sides. So I'm going to get the natural log of z sub 0 equals when I do e to a natural log, that just removes that exponent, and it drops it down the bottom. So I get negative x squared minus 2y squared. All right, let's multiply through by negative 1, and I get the negative natural log of z sub 0 equals x squared plus 2y squared. Now, for what z sub 0 values will this work? Were they ever defined in the original problem? No, they were not. So we need to look and see what values of z sub 0 make sense. Suppose I do z sub 0 equals 1. Then I get the natural log, negative natural log of 1, equals x squared plus 2y squared. Well, what is that? Negative natural, one is, uh, na negative natural log of 1 is 0, so I get 0 equals x squared plus 2y squared. That's just the point 0, 0. All right. What if I let z sub 0 be 0? Would that make sense? Let's try it. Let's let z sub 0 be 0. That would not make sense because then I'll end up with a natural log of 0, which doesn't exist. What if z sub 0 was the reciprocal of e? So what if z sub 0 was 1 over e? Then what would I get? I would get the negative natural log 
of 1 over e, which is e to the negative first, equals x squared plus 2y squared. Ooh. The natural log of e to the negative first is negative 1. Now apply that negative to the negative 1, and we get 1. So I get 1 equals x squared plus 2y squared. It's an ellipse. And that's the biggest of the ellipses that you're going to get. So that's sort of the boundary ellipse. Any other ellipses that you get are going to fall inside of that. So you can put other values for z sub 0 besides that, but you'll get more ellipses that just fall inside of that. So that was a rather complicated one. You're not going to find as many complicated ones as that, but I thought I should at least do the video on the most complicated ones and not the easiest ones. All right, let's take a look at one more case here. Well, a couple of more cases. All right, let's take a look at the domain of this function. This is a function f of x, y, z. So now my domain is going to have three variables. What three variables will work in there? Surprising, not surprisingly, I guess, we're going to work the same way that we did when we had f of x, y. And that is, as long as this number remains above 25, we're okay. Right? Greater than or equal to 25, and we produce something that's zero or greater. If that thing ends up being less than 25, then we're in trouble because we end up with the square root of a negative number. So I would like negative x squared minus y squared minus z squared to be greater than or equal to 25. Okay, how can I make that happen? Multiply through by negative 1, and I get x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 25. So my domain is actually a closed ball in R3. Center to the origin, which in this case in three dimensions is 0, 0, 0, with a radius of 5. And that's my domain. Any point, any triple inside of that ball will work. Any triple outside of that ball will not work. All right, functions and multiple variables. I just picked this because I thought this was kind of a neat example of multiple variables that were something besides X and Y. Baseball season, we don't know when it's going to start, but when it does, you'll have an earned run average. An earned run average is found by taking 9E and divided by I. E is the number of earned runs that a pitcher has given up. I is the number of innings that are pitched. So their earned run average depends on two things how many earned runs they gave up, and how many innings they pitched. Those two values will give you their earned run average. So let's try it for a numerical version. right? Single season, the lowest record for the lowest ERA was set in 1914, and that was 24 earned runs in 224 innings of pitching. So my formula is that the earned run average in terms of runs earned and innings pitched is nine times the number of runs you've earned divided by the number of innings you've pitched. So this person pitched or got 24 earned runs, that was the lowest ever recorded, in 224 innings. So I should take nine times 24 and divide it by 224. When I do, I get 0.8. 9643. What that means is that in his average game, this pitcher gave up less than one home run in every game, which is pretty spectacular, right? That's what that means. The second question says to graph the level curves for four, home, four earned runs. So what does it mean to graph the level curves on four earned runs? We want to graph a of ei equals 4. Another way of saying that is 9e over i, that was our formula for earned runs, equals 4. Well, let's solve that thing for e. Let's multiply both sides by i and divide by 9. So when I do that, I'll get 4i over 9 equals e. So if I set this up like this, I'm going to set up a graph. I'll put e on this axis. I'll put I on this axis, and I end up with a line that says for every 4 in this direction, I have 9 in this direction. Right, so if I want a little set point, here's what that level curve looks like for an earned run average of 4. 
What does that mean? That means that for every nine innings, they gave up four runs or they gave up four ninths of a run per inning. All right, so a little bit under half for each inning. All right, this is getting a little bit long, so I think we'll stop here in 15-2. We'll come up as a second video.